The Biden administration in Washington has definitely been pushing electric vehicles for some time. In fact, they've been in competition with Canada on that front. But just recently, they announced that they were going to impose a 100% tariff on Chinese-made electric vehicles. What's the reasoning behind that? What does it mean for Canada's industry? What does it mean for Canadian consumers? That's what we're going to talk about today on the Full Comment Podcast. Hello, my name's Brian Lilly. This is the Full Comment Podcast. And today, a guest who knows all about the auto industry, inside and out, it's Flavio Volpe. He is the president of the Auto Parts Manufacturers Association of Canada. He is someone who has been at all of the big announcements that you've seen with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, with Ontario Premier Doug Ford, regarding investment in the EV sector in this country. But Flavio, well, first off, thanks for the time. But I want to start with this Biden move. Um, it, it, it surprised me a little bit. There was a 25% tariff on electric vehicles coming out of China. Now it's going to 100%. What's the reasoning? It may not be enough, to be honest. We're, we're dealing with, um, with a you know, geopolitical adversary, uh, who's been um, uh, preparing for uh, the last couple of decades uh, to put themselves in a position uh, to have advantages in advanced manufacturing uh, over the Western sphere. Um, they do it with um, uh, cheap and sometimes forced labor. They do it with um, environmental regulations be damned. Uh, they, uh, they and, and by that, you mean they either don't have them or they ignore them? Well, you know, they're very clever. They have them. And then uh, when the national interest is at play, like, hey, by the way, let's build a plant for Tesla in Shanghai and get it up and running within a year. Well, we're not really worried about uh, about uh, local regs and uh, environmental concerns and uh, and uh, displacement of uh, other interests. So just, boom, get it done. Um you know they they they've invested quite heavily in all the raw materials and uh, uh and primary uh, uh materials that go into making cars and so they are the <clears throat> the world's leaders in cheap steel and cheap aluminum and cheap lithium and cheap rubber and cheap everything and so they put together cars that the west taught them how to build over the last 20 years and big joint ventures with companies like uh Volkswagen and uh and uh, Stellantis and General Motors and and Tesla. Now they're ready to flood, yeah, and Tesla. Now they're ready to flood the the market with uh, cars. Uh, you know, I talked to someone today who said, "Oh well, why shouldn't we have access to uh to that uh, BYD vehicle that's uh that's fifteen thousand dollars?" And I said, "Well, why don't you ask yourself why it's fifteen thousand dollars? That's that's not even the price of the battery. What, who are you getting into bed with?" So there's a phrase that you used just a moment ago that I want you to expand upon. You said advanced manufacturing. Now we've known for a long time that China has used their industrial might to ship over all kinds of manufactured products for us. Right? Try, try going shopping for any kitchen wares. You, you know, you, you need something for your kitchen. You need a new mixing bowl. You need a utensil. You need an, a small appliance. You need baking sheet. It doesn't matter it's going to be hard to find something not made in China. Even the big European brands on things like knives have lower tier uh, versions of their products made in China. But that's that's low-end manufacturing. Explain why it's important about the advanced manufacturing. Well, they learned over the last um, 25, 30 years um, how to be efficient at uh, volume manufacturing on very specific items, uh, you know, all the knickknacks that that uh, we all need to live a functional life, you know, the kind of stuff that you run out to uh, to Walmart for, um, the commoditized goods. In, in our business, we call them the one-shot molds, you know. Um, they, they got really good at making the molds to make the plastic uh, goods or the tools to make um, the, the, the metallic goods. Um, but... You know, they, they invested quite heavily uh, in uh, electronics, uh, complex sub-assemblies like electric motors. You know, all those toys and those, those, those ceiling fans that you bought all have motors in them. And an electric motor is a rather simple device. Uh, you know, you've got uh, reverse polarity and, a, and an electromagnet and a, 
and a rod in the middle and a and a casting. You know, uh, it's not too different uh, the the motor that uh, is running in your electric vehicle than is running in uh, in uh, you know the the toys you played with uh, when you were growing up. Um, they they position themselves well for the West to outsource as much of the manufacturing uh, that uh, we could um, uh, to drive costs down in an uber competitive market driven uh, global economy. Um, They learned from us. Um, They learned that we did not have uh, the raw materials uh, required to feed the beast. That's plastics, metals, rare earths, critical minerals, and they had them. They learned that um, we take 8, 12, 15 years for uh, some approvals because, uh, you know, we have uh, not just economic stewardship here. We have environmental stewardship, uh, community stewardship. You know, you're, you're going to do a, a major mining project of any kind in, in Canada. If, you know, there's lots of steps, including um, uh, dealing with indigenous communities and affected communities. So they said, well, what if we threw the state behind just getting it done in China? Oh, uh, we've got some veins of lithium on this plot. Just get the excavator out. Um, get the rocks out. Uh, hey, uh, I, I, you know, not to be flippant, but sure. You know, if, if China d- discovered that there was uh, valuable minerals under a specific village, I would see them move in the entire village just to get at them. Yeah, they have a they have a history of um, doing what they need to do to focus on their objective, which is affecting the global balance of power, becoming the world's uh, uh, most important superpower. Uh, they're, you know, in the in the past, you do gunboat uh, diplomacy. Here, what they've done is uh, it's uh, it's uh, economic uh, uh, extortion in some cases, uh, 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 giving you cheap money and cheap goods. Uh, putting their money in their, you know, infrastructure initiatives around the world in places where unfortunately the U S and the West pulled out after the Soviet uh, era ended. Um, and Chinese money has flown into, uh, Africa has flown into Central America has flown into Eastern Europe and all over South Asia. And, um, they're, they are more focused than we are because it isn't about cars for them. It certainly isn't about clean cars for them. It's about um, affecting uh, the global balance of power in their favor. And we uh, naively walked into the bus saw that we ordered at a cheap price. Now, in in terms of global balance of power, just being dominant in manufacturing is simply part of that, correct? So... (laughs) Yeah, uh, th- this is part of a long term plan. It's it's not just about being dominant in the EV sector, although that's that's the current discussion we're having. It's about being dominant everywhere, having control. Yeah, that's right. I think I think they, like you know I don't want to moralize and fault them for 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 wanting to have a preeminent position. But I'm certainly not naive to the fact that that's what they're looking for. You know when we. Let's say, for example, as we uh, as everything uh, digitizes uh, around the planet, uh, goods, uh, the way they interact, uh, security, everything else. One of the core products is semiconductors, and we've had a semiconductor crisis over the last couple of years, brought on by the global pandemic. Um, but we we all rely, both in China and in the West, on an incredible cluster of semiconductor manufacturer in Taiwan, which is a Hardly contested subject in uh, Beijing. Is Taiwan a Chinese province or is Taiwan, as the West says, its own country? Um, we, we are all vulnerable, both sides of the equation, to if we lost access to Taiwanese semiconductors at the, uh, before we build up our own capacity, um, uh, we'll all have a problem. You know, the, the, the machines you and I are using to talk to each other are, are, are dependent on that capacity. Well, l- look at what, look at how China is acting geopolitically with uh, Taiwan. Look what they did with uh, Hong Kong during the pandemic. Um, you know, we're, we, we are, they're no longer worried that the Americans might send the seventh fleet uh, through the Taiwan Strait. Uh, they are forcing recognition around the world 
uh, that, uh, well, maybe China does have a point. Maybe the Taiwanese are with them. They, 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 they've got Joe Biden uh, last year saying, well, if, if the Chinese invaded Taiwan, uh, they would be met militarily by the U.S. and then the White House walking that back in a week. That's power. That's, that's the growth of Chinese soft power based on the, on the strength of the Chinese economic power. We are indebted. The world is indebted to this Chinese base, and we act differently. And, and so they've got this new car. So Canada, the United States, in the middle of revamping to the the future electric model. And we'll talk about the controversy around that, because I know some listeners are yelling as they're listening <laughs> to you and I talk, ah, EVs don't work. I'm never going to drive any. And we know all that. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But let's just look at it from a geopolitical point of view still. and. You know, over the weekend, a piece moved on the wires from Associated Press that was just glowing about the twelve thousand dollar U.S. or about sixteen thousand dollar Canadian Seagull by BYD. That's the the fifteen thousand odd dollar vehicle that you mentioned earlier, and they've got a cheaper one for shorter range that cost under ten thousand dollars U.S. And they're talking about how beautifully it's made and it's wonderful. Um. These are vehicles that China is literally making to flood the world market. There, there was a story in Le Monde out of Paris uh, last week about how Antwerp, the port in Antwerp in Belgium, is just flooded with these vehicles, and some of them will sit there for a year. And why are they there? Because China has a goal of achieving 25% minimum of the European electric vehicle market. And so they're subsidized. Like, why are the cars so cheap? Because the government is subsidizing them. And they want us to be beholden to them for our future vehicles and our future manufacturing. Yeah, it's the old, uh, you know, I grew up at a time when we said, say no to drugs. And, uh, you know, all the all the different uh, PSAs of like, oh, uh, your pusher is going to give you some for free. Uh, the first one's on me. Well, that's what this is. H- how does a vehicle that has the same dimensions and presumably meets the same crash and safety standards and, and, and uh, uh, standards on the chemistry and, and, and the metallurgy um, cost less than the bill of materials for the competition? Uh, people don't ask themselves uh, what they're getting uh, in return uh, uh, in exchange for uh, this deal. And, you know, that's, well, that's a typical consumer, you know, look, we're in tough times. Uh, money's tight. The cost of money's high. Uh, if you can relieve some of my, uh, uh, my burden, I'll take it. And, um, that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're putting that out on offer. Um, these aren't, you know, I, I keep listening to people. I've done a bunch of interviews the last few days where they say, well, the environmental lobby says, um, this is really good for the environment. And uh, you're just an automotive lobbyist who is trying to uh, help the fat cats uh, keep eating. And I said, well, you know, I, I represent a business where the profit margins are in the low, sing- low to mid single digits and uh, who are beholden uh, in for electronics, for raw materials to the Chinese already. Uh, and we have a very healthy regulatory environment here in Canada and the U.S. You, you, there are the rules are very straightforward and you can't break them without major penalty. Um, and we're up against China Inc. These are state owned enterprises who are saying, Hey, by the way, well, you guys are being naive. I just sold your, I just sold your family uh, uh, and friends uh, a vehicle that's going to put you out of business. So you have been, I mentioned off the top that you've been at all, all the big EV announcements with prime minister Trudeau with premier Ontario, premier Doug Ford. You've lobbied for the EV sector in this country. I'm not, ca- I'm not calling you a fat cat lobbyist like those critics, Flavio, but... Um, I used the, to be skinnier, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so did we all. Yeah. Uh, but you, you've been at these events and you've been supportive. But, but now you've been critical of the Trudeau government's policy on how fast we have to go to electric vehicles because you've said that it's going too fast. Is your worry that we're all going to run out and buy the it, it, buy these BYD or other Chinese uh, vehicles that are, are cheap and cheerful and we'll get the job done, 
but then you're kind of locked into it. It's, it's like when you when you choose your phone, is it Apple or is it Android? And then you're locked into that system. And then when you go to replace it, well, you're going to replace it with what already exists. And so, you know, the Trudeau government has, has spent a lot of money, time, and capital trying to attract investment here. And and yet they're turning around and, and bringing in regulations that will, if it goes through, force us all to buy a Chinese product before the Canadian product's ready. Yeah, that's at the core of it. And, you know, like I, I you know, I think people know me as championing the EV manufacturer in Canada, but I want to be specific. I'm a car guy. I am championing the, the, the auto industry in Canada, the uh, governments around the world. And then car makers around the world have said, uh, governments have said, we've got to go to zero emissions and there are no exceptions. Car makers around the world have said, Yep, we're, we'll do it faster than you, and we'll do it faster. Than you. They all lined up to do it. In Canada, we don't have a Canadian automaker. We make two million cars here, but those are uh, those are companies are headquartered in Tokyo and Detroit and Paris. And so, I represent the parts suppliers who supply all this production. And what we've said to the government is, we can only make what the car makers order, and we uh, have constantly. Uh, uh, pitched our latest technologies, light weighting, uh, high voltage. Uh, some of the you know powertrain suppliers said, well, we make engines for you. We can make motors for you. We built Project Aero. And some of your listeners might know about that, projectaero.ca. We built a a 100% uh, Canadian car set for the screens. I couldn't get screens from anywhere but China. Um, bumper to bumper, working prototype to, to highlight, you know, um, you know the, the the entire landscape of Canadian technology that can serve the world's EV um, uh, supply chain. But um, the government's been very good in supporting. You know, on all these announcements that you talk about, industry, Canada, and finance have really said, "Okay, fine. Uh, we would like the people who are making cars here now and supplying cars and assembling them and doing the the raw materials, those Canadians, to be the Canadians that make." Um, uh, EVs. Let's just ha help those companies transition. But the environment de department has said, oh, well, let's force the market to. Let's say 100% of the sales in Canada by 2035 must be electric. And if, you, if you're if you a car company that doesn't meet the 20% goal by 2026 or 60% goal by 2030, every vehicle that doesn't meet the threshold, you, you're going to pay a $20,000 fine, whether you make cars in Canada or not. Um, if you sell cars into Canada, like VinFast from Vietnam or Tesla from Shanghai, not Texas, um, and they're electric, but you have no Canadian content on it and you have no investment in Canada, uh, but you meet that threshold or exceed it, we'll give you a $20,000 credit. Oh, my and, goodness. Yeah. And so if I, I, I don't think people know that that's what we're talking about. So it's crazy. So. Someone like, you know, a company like General Motors has been in Canada yeah. for, what, 115 years or so? Yeah, that's more. right. Yeah. yeah. And and so if they don't meet that threshold for every car sold in Canada, so maybe they sell 100,000 cars above the th threshold, that's going to be 20 grand a car. Yeah. Look, the numbers for a company like that or a company like a Toyota, they make, they make 300,000 cars or four or 500,000 cars a year here, they sell about the same. So let's say you, let's say the target is 20% by 2026 and you've sold 300,000 uh, cars here, but you only sold um, 45,000 electric vehicles because Canadian consumers didn't buy them. Um, you're short 15,000. Well, 15,000 times 20,000 is a $300 million fine for a company that also makes cars here. Now, if you make those electric cars here and Canadians don't buy them, but you sell them to Americans, so 80% of the cars that we make in Canada are sold to Americans, you don't get a credit for the battery electric vehicle you made in Windsor that got sold a kilometer away in Detroit. But VinFast that makes cars in um, Vietnam, who sold a modest 2,000 here last year, well, we're going to give them 2,000 times 20,000 uh, in credits, here's forty million dollars uh, that uh, uh, that you got for being green, I guess. Uh, uh, BYD, if they sold fifty thousand of these uh, 
$12,000 cars or $15,000 cars, we would give them a billion dollars in credits so that they could oh, yeah, sell but, them. To- but, but, but hold on. Yeah. You said they will get $20,000 per car sold. That's yeah. more than the car costs. It's crazy, Brian. It's not, there's no, if, if it sounds crazy, trust me, I do this every day, all day long. It doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm not getting it wrong. You can have the, you can have uh, the Minister of the Environment on. You can have Transport Canada on. Who yes, run- St- St- Stephen Gibo and I have not been on good terms in a very <laughs> long time, so that's not going to happen. Well, t- here, let me give you another example that will make people crazy. There's a there's a there's a five thousand dollar purchase incentive available from the federal government if you buy an electric vehicle here in Canada. Okay, the province of Ontario doesn't have it. Some other provinces do. To qualify for that, you just have to have buy an electric vehicle as long as it's under fifty five thousand dollars. Doesn't matter where it comes from. Well, last year, Transport Canada that runs the program spent one hundred and thirty million dollars in incentives on cars made in China. I mean, it's sorry, insane. One hundred and thirty five million. One hundred and thirty million of of dollars generated by Canadian citizens and companies in the tax base paid out to cars made in China. And you'll have people who say, I've been arguing with them for the last two days now since uh, Biden made his news here, people on the environmental side, we need those electric cars, devil be damned. And well, okay, so we're going to give cash to China and we're going to ignore the fact that China makes these cars in the dirtiest industrial environment on the planet so that so that you can virtue signal in your neighborhood. By the way, um, you know, they said, you know, the argument has been, you know, otherwise electric vehicles are just luxury goods. And, you know, this is a discretionary purchase. Every vehicle is a discretionary purchase. Uh, if you're naive enough to, th- to think that we should all lay down for Chinese manufacturing, I really don't know where to start the argument. If you tell me that you have lower disposable income and you need a cheaper option, I really understand that. I truly do. But it's not up to the consumer to decide. They're not equipped to decide. They're, that's not the, the job we pay them to do to understand balance of power politics between the U.S. and China and where Canada should sit. And Canada absolutely should sit inside North America. I, um, you know, you're talking about these rebates that the feds give out and different provinces give out. My big problem and and I come this at this from a particular point of view. All of us have our biases. We all have something in our background that informs our decisions. I come from Hamilton. It's a steel town. Food on my table was a result of selling steel to auto manufacturers, right? And so I never understood why the previous wind government in Ontario, with, you know, and, and Ontario is the big manufacturing hub why were we giving out subsidies to cars made in china and elsewhere before we ever had she she never put anything into trying to attract the uh, ev manufacturing just said we'll subsidize you to buy a chinese car and i thought this is the craziest thing we're undermining our own industry and i guess that's kind of the, the theme of the whole discussion that we're having today yeah yeah, you know what? Um, when uh, when Doug Ford uh, uh, formed government here, uh, the, you know, in our first meetings, I said, you know, the purchase incentives. I know they're really popular with enthusiasts, and let's put enthusiasts aside. You know, I represent the the people who make parts for cars or assemble these cars in Canada. L- l- they are a secondary priority. Once you take the money that you're spending on, and that was at, at that time up to fourteen thousand dollars for. You know, if you wanted to buy a Porsche 19, 918 Spider for nine hundred seventy-five thousand, we'll give you fourteen thousand off. We said, take that money, invest it in the manufacturing footprint uh, for those vehicles. Uh, in Hamilton, um, uh, ArcelorMittal DeFasco sells five billion dollars worth of steel to the local. Um, automotive sector here in Canada and yep. uh, in the, in the Great Lakes region, you know, ask them about uh, the practices of Chinese steel, uh, steel dumping, uh, uh, steel uh, that comes uh, through other countries, uh, the predatory pricing on it. You know, uh, the, the Chinese sell finished goods out of steel for uh, 
their, per, their, their selling price is less than the spot price of the raw material here. How? It, you know, it's not, it didn't come in from outer space. It means somebody else paid the bill. And that's really I, corporate, uh, corporate China. You know, I remember when Donald Trump was in the White House and he had an issue with Chinese steel coming in through Canada. Yeah. We'd give it a quick polish, try and send it to the States as Canadian steel. And he said, you got to stop doing this. For a year, he said, just got to stop doing this. Our government refused. He put tariffs. And I was like, guys, of course he's going to do that. Like, why, why are you protecting Chinese steel coming in uh, to the point where it hurts our, our, our homegrown industry? But anyways, we, you've mentioned the issue of manufacturing and, uh, and the supports from the Trudeau and the Ford governments. That's been controversial. Uh, you know that I've supported it, but I'm going to play devil's advocate when we come back after this break. So, Flavio, um, the idea that the federal and provincial governments of Ontario are going to back the EV manufacturing sector in this country has been incredibly controversial. First off, let's deal with the opening part. The number of times I hear from people, EVs won't work. EVs don't work. This is just a boondoggle. What do you say to them? I mean, a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions about technology. It's, it's, it's a little strange to be honest. Uh, it, it, the technology isn't brand new. I mean, uh, in uh, in the ni- in the nineteen tens, the New York City cab company ran electric vehicles. Their batteries, uh, lead acid batteries that they had uh, that they bought from Japan. It's 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 an it's a story as old as the industry. Um, the cars are a superior experience. I think what people are upset about is a is a is. A, there's a few pieces. Number one, this is a country whose economy relies heavily on a healthy oil and gas sector. Um, we, we, I think we lose sight of that in central and eastern Canada, but a lot of the bills get paid by what happens um, in uh, in uh, in Alberta specifically, but also uh, you know in uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, when you power a vehicle with electricity. Uh, you're not powering it with the products that are currently helping to pay the bills and employ people in good paying jobs and careers. Um, and so they, they look at EVs as a threat and, and, you know, it's certainly understandable. Uh, the, the, you know, I won't, I won't moralize over that. I've always said maybe the best partners we should have are the balance sheets of the oil and gas companies to help pay some of these bills so they don't go through Ottawa and then back out. Um, everybody's going to have to transition. The only debate is how long. And then the other thing is, um, you know, people get really sanctimonious about EVs, uh, and they're, they say, well, you've got to, you've got to do your part for the environment. Um, and then they are the same people who the last couple of days are really upset that the Joe Biden might say, oh, look, let's even the playing field. If you want cheap Chinese cars, then uh, you're going to have to pay a little bit more for it. And then they lose their minds, uh, and ignore the fact that the Chinese are the top polluters in the world. And so, they listen to that sanctimony. Uh, it's easier yeah, to. We're, we're still in, yeah. it, we're still exporting coal to China. You know, we're we're part of the problem, and, and they're building a cold fired plant a week. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think that I think that Canada is in a position, and the reason why I like the transition to EVs, I don't like the schedule that we have on it. I think it's unrealistic. Hundred percent by twenty thirty five will never happen. You and I will do this podcast as old men then or whatever we'll do in 2035, <laughs> maybe like a hologram or something. Uh, and the number will be 35 or 40%. Uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, uh, the Canadian, so EVs are driven by batteries. Batteries are driven by chemistry that are, that is able to hold and discharge uh, power efficiently. And that comes from lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel, graphite. We have that in Canada. We don't have it ready. It's going to be 10 years before it's ready. But, if that's the biggest expense in an EV, a battery might be a $25,000 uh, product. Um, and we have it and the Americans don't and the Germans don't and the Japanese don't. Uh, we may be able to, on a mid to long-term play, become an uh, outsized player in the most uh, lucrative and strategically important consumer good in the world. Um, but I, but these are complicated 
uh, these are complicated objectives. And it t- it, the Chinese have taken 30 years to get there with a centrally planned economy. It's going to take us a lot longer to get there. And I think, I think we all have to start listening to each other a little bit more and stop being sanctimonious on both ends of the debate. I, we are going to move from fossil fuels, but we're going to move in the next 40, 50 years. And we are going to go to zero emission transportation and we may lead it. But if we rush the market there before it's ready, it's going to buy from the Chinese that are, are 10 times, 100 times the, uh, the, uh, the risk on uh, uh, CO2s than uh, anything that we're doing in Western Canada. And, and so at that point, we're rewarding people who are polluting more than what we're trying to replace. Yeah, I sat down with the CEO of a supercar company in Italy. Uh, I won't tell you which one, but it's got a horse on the front. And he said to me, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think about all this? And I said, well, I think you have to you have to develop a product that is zero emissions. I mean, you're a responsible company. It's publicly traded. I said, but um, by the time we get to 2028, 2029, uh, and all of these uh, countries fail against their their targets, they're going to recalibrate what the, what the actual – target is. It's going to be CO2 emissions uh, on your entire company footprint, not just your cars. And so buy your steel in Quebec or your aluminum in Quebec because it's driven by hydroelectric. Get your lithium in in Northern Ontario um, and um, you know try to put yourself in a good position. And, and his reflection to me is this feels a little bit like let's sweep the dirt off the floors in our house and put it outside and then say it's all clean. The dirt still exists. If you're going to go buy dirty, uh, you're going to buy cheap, clean cars from dirty jurisdictions. You just put it outside the door. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means you close the door on it, but everybody else can see it. The other critique of what Trudeau and Ford have been doing in terms of the Stellantis deal, the Volkswagen deal, now the Honda deal. And I know the Honda deal is very, it's organized very differently, but you know, that's, that's lost on a lot of people, but so is the fact that money has not been handed to these companies yet. So I'm constantly asked, why are we giving them $13 billion and they haven't built a car yet? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, uh, the answer is a, is a really simple one. Um, the, unlike in 2010, when we bailed out, um, uh, General Motors and Chrysler then at the time where we wrote a check, Canada wrote a check for $13.7 billion. It was like, here's a check, fingers crossed. I hope you survive. I think it was the right decision, by the way. I think we don't give enough credit to Stephen Harper and Dalton McGinty for that, but we saved the, the, the industry and, and, uh, you know, tens of thousands of jobs. Now, what we've done is we made a commitment to companies like Volkswagen and Stellantis and said, if you make these goods, um, at this volume in these years, and you demonstrate to us that you did. So, uh, 400,000 batteries for one and, uh, a, a, a million batteries for the other one. Uh, that's generating, you know, $10 billion in activity and probably $2 billion in taxes, new taxes generated every year. We'll let you keep some up to $13 billion. It's different. Um, the, uh, okay, but but hold on. You said two billion in taxes, but they get to keep thirteen per year. Per year. So what their commitment is thirteen billion over a long period of time that goes to twenty thirty two, but they're going to start generating two billion dollars in in uh, revenue in in uh, twenty twenty five, and so it is a it's a it's a performance based incentive. It's based on new taxes uh, that we will just forego, but. Uh, but, so, the, but but they're still going to be paying taxes. Oh yeah, they'll definitely. So what'll happen is, they'll do. So if you do four hundred thousand batteries a year, we'll take Stellantis for example in Windsor. They said they're going to do four hundred thousand batteries a year. We know those batteries are twenty five thousand dollars each. Those batteries will go into vehicles in uh, Windsor and in Brampton. So they'll generate an HST of thirteen percent. So ten billion dollars of activity generating one point three billion dollars worth of worth of HST. Then there's the corporate taxes that the company will pay and the personal income taxes of all the employees and the employer's contributions. We think that totals two billion a year. If they uh, produce the batteries, they get the subsidy. That subsidy will come out of that extra two billion dollars worth of taxes. If they don't, they won't. Now the problem and the reason we're having a 
very public debate, Brian, is that we've gone out and and struck these deals and then we crow about the deals, but we don't explain the second part. And so people quite rightly say, we're in kind of tough times. Everything's expensive. We've got a lot of competing interests. You give $13 billion to who? And instead, if if they took the time, if they found a way to consistently explain it like I did, which is if they build it and they generate new taxes, we will forgive some of those new taxes. Oh, it's diff- and it's about 25%, right? Uh, oh, you mean the, uh, the, the, what the, the forgiveness? Is worth? Yeah, yeah, it's about that. Yeah, it's about that. And, and so you sit there and say, okay, well, that's a little bit different. You're, 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 you're making a, a bet with nothing down. That's, uh, or little down. It's not nothing down. We did put a billion dollars of public money, uh, 500 from the feds, 500 from the province on that plant in Windsor. But, you know, you're in the big leagues. There's always going to be a franchise fee. There's always going to be a payroll fee, but, but, you know, you got to go out and win. And um, we we just do a, you know, in my opinion, and I say this with respect to my friends at Queen's Park and at, in Ottawa, sometimes we spend more time announcing and crowing about a deal than doing the, the careful, thoughtful explanation to the people who pay the taxes on why there's going to be a return and what we use that return for. Those are communities with a healthy economic uh, industrial basin who then pay for the things that base that tax base pays for the things that are important in those communities, schools, hospitals, roads. Um, a, a city like St. Thomas saw two major plants leave in 2008 uh, and 2010. It's a ghost town. If I owned a house in St. Thomas, what do you think the value of my house was then? And if I had a mortgage on a house that was 300,000 and then my mortgage was 250,000, but the cost of the house the price of the house, the value uh, dropped down to two hundred thousand on renewal. I lose the house. Okay, but your critics would say that at the end of all this, it works yeah. out to four million dollars per job. I, the critics aren't in the business, uh, or or even in business. You never do a for you, you never do a per job calculation. You turn around and say, "Oh, well, take the Honda one for example." Um, you, you put five billion dollars uh, of public money into a fifteen billion dollar investment by Honda. If that fifteen billion dollar investment produces an extra two billion dollars a year in taxes and in tax revenue, like we talked about, it's how long uh, do we go before you get your five billion dollars back? In that case, less than three years of full production. It's it's not a we never have the jobs argument in AI. We never have the job like cost per jobs uh, in healthcare. We just say, okay, what's your return on investment? It, uh, automotive is an easy target because we've had cycles, decade long cycles of boom and bust, uh, and uh, you know the, the the automakers are not you know, not Canadian based. You don't have a Canadian CEO of uh, Canada Motors that you can take the task. Um, and I think people are a, a little bit jaded, and rightfully so, that they've seen government investments in automotive in the past. And then that company says, oh, well, we got tough times and we're out and chase us. Um, what we learned from that, and I was involved in some of those deals, as you know, I worked uh, uh, in government uh, in an earlier chapter of my life. We learned that we we don't flow money uh, uh, against a promise. We flow money against performance. Uh, bring me the receipts, show me, and then, then we'll give you the credit against it. When, when so, we give, so you're, you're giving them a tax break yeah, rather than giving them money up front. Yeah. And if you give them money, not, up not front, you, but the government. Yeah, yeah. And if you give them money up front, what you do is you get first charge against the asset. I'll get first charge against the plant. I'll get first charge against your tooling. And yeah, I'm not going to be able to recover all of it, um, but you're not going to be able to borrow against it. And it's a bigger bet that uh, a, a, a more sure bet, uh, by government, uh, we we we're all learning. Um, while the Chinese and others, not just the Chinese, but others, are at full sprint, and um, you know, uh, I'll take for example the the Vietnamese have a car company now. You know, when we were negotiating the TPP in 2015 and 16, everybody said to me because I was saying, "Why are we letting the?" Vietnamese and the Malaysians into a deal tariff free that could sell their goods to us. You know, well, what are the Vietnamese sell to us? They're not a threat. I said, I know they're a threat. They, they, they have a, a manufacturing culture. 
They are one of the world's, you know, supply chains in, in commoditized goods. Uh, these are earnest people who, who uh, want to join the world stage. Well, the biggest noodle maker in Vietnam decided to put his fortune uh, uh, with an equal bet from the federal government to build a company called VinFest. And now you can go to Yorkdale Shopping Center and buy a VinFest. Not one, one stitch in that car is uh, Canadian. Uh, they're all EVs. The federal government's giving them a $20,000 credit for everyone they sell here. Do you have to sell at a profit when you sell a, a $50,000 or $60,000 car uh, that gets and, a 20000 the federal credit? Government, like that, that, that's your profit is what the Trudeau yeah. government's giving you. Yeah. And I, look, it's, it's a pen stroke away from fixing it. You just say, um, uh, no, you're not going to give that uh, credit or you're not going to require local manufacturers to buy one. Then that just turns, you know, VinFast's credit into nothing. Um, we, we, you, you go buy a VinFast, beautiful cars, by the way. This is not a criticism of the company. They went and got Ferrari's designer, Pininfarina, to make them. Uh, if you get a $5,000 purchase incentive from the feds, it's easier for you to buy it. You know, we're, we're all kind of uh, struggling for how to make ends meet. Great. But we just sent that $5,000 to Vietnam. I mean, but, what, well, what? but you, the consumer, gets $5,000 and then the company <laughs> yeah. gets $20,000. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why do they have to worry about having a high price? Yeah. So now you're an auto worker. Let's forget about me. Who, who, who cares who I am? You're working in a plant in Windsor or Brampton or Oakville or, 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 or Oshawa, and uh, you've got a good job. Uh, you know, maybe you and your partner work in the plant or work in the business and you have a dual income where, you know, you're pulling in $180,000, $200,000 a year with overtime, like really, really uh, usable material wages. Um, and you you are in a plant. The Canadian plants have gotten 38% of the J.D. Powers Productivity and Quality Awards uh, since the late 90s, and we have maybe 11% of production. These are people who are doing a super job. And you find out uh, that uh, the government's got a side door open that allows the Chinese to flood the market to you and your neighbors to buy their goods uh, with workers that in some cases are forced labor, but when they're not forced, they get five, six bucks an hour treated like garbage. Uh, 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 People who cynically, a, a country that cynically doesn't care about the environment uh, locally, domestically, when they want to uh, build their global uh, hegemony, uh, but but preach it to Canadians. And now you're going to lose your job to to that. And don't you want your government to fight for your job? Well, we're doing a great job on the investment side, but we left the door wide open on this mandate credit side. Should Canada follow the Biden government's uh, path and do do the tariff? Should have done it yesterday. Um, they, they don't really, we really don't have a, we really don't have an option. We should have done it anyway, um, regardless of what the U.S. are doing. The U.S. had a 27.5% tariff. Uh, all we had was a 6.1% most favored nation uh, WTO tariff. I went down uh, in the first week of November. So we spoke to, in, in Ottawa in October. Then in November, we went down and and uh, spoke to um, uh, White House Treasury Energy Transportation and said, the Chinese are coming. You should know that the Chinese imports into Mexico next door to you went up four, 400% last year. Uh, in Europe, 330%. Uh, they, uh, y- you have a bunch of doors that are open. You better close them fast. Uh, then we spoke about it publicly. Then I spoke about it to the press and at a conference caused a major kerfuffle. I got a lot of people who don't like me, uh, who, um, who, uh, who were in Mexico, uh, and or in the U S relying on Chinese supply chains. I was the happiest person in this country when I saw what, uh, what the Biden administration did a couple of days ago. It doesn't mean you can't buy, um, uh, a BYD, um, whatever that car, whatever that model is called. Uh, it just means that you can't buy it for 15000 It means that you have to pay 30000 for it. And it's all relative. It's still $10,000 cheaper than the average uh, vehicle in the U.S., but it's got to hurt a little bit. That $15,000 uh, is uh, tariff tax revenue collected by the U.S. government. That maybe helps to pay that $330 billion they're investing in domestic EVs. We can't. We 
I, I love when people uh, so boldly say, you should be fine with some competition. And, uh, and this is about the environment. Well, they don't play by the rules over there. Don't be naive. Yeah. Flavio, yeah. Uh, talking about putting big tariffs on things kind of makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a free trade kind of guy, but yeah. you can't be doing free trade with a country that has their government subsidize their industry so that they can become the dominant player or that does not have the same labor standards or environmental standards. Otherwise we're tying our hands behind our backs yep. and asking our workers to pay the price. And that's not a good, good outcome. Yeah. I mean, I don't even have to say anything. You just said the whole thing. Like it is, it is, uh, uh you make the major leagues, you're on a roster, uh, you're pitching against the lineup, uh, that you say, okay, look, I got to be better than the than the hitter, and um, let the uh, best player, let the best team win, and and then and then you lose, and then you find out that that team was recording the pitches and making noises in the dugout to make sure that they knew what was coming, and they cheated, and they win the World Series, and they're the Houston Astros in twenty seventeen. <laughs> I was going to say uh, yeah. Houston. You talking yeah. about Houston? Yeah, and Houston gets to keep the the got to keep the the trophy because Major League Baseball said the only way we're going to find out about it is if we give people immunity and then and then they'll confess to us. They did. Well, if you lost to Houston in that series, you don't have a World Series ring. Um, uh, the integrity of the game uh, is greatly diminished, and you can no longer say the game is a balanced. Uh, free market to play like we pretend the auto market is. The Chinese are the 2017 Houston Astros. And uh, when you buy their cars, they win. When they buy our market share, they win. But we don't have to wait for an investigation. We know. We know. So if you want to do it, if you say, if, if the government here or the market here or environmentalists here say, what's more important is climate and the air over the roads in um, in uh, Lethbridge and in uh, Trois Rivières must be clean, um, and that you can close your eyes to the fact that there is no wall on the borders of this country that we all share the same atmosphere. Um, then have at it, but it's a luxury to be that naive. I mean, I certainly am not, and. You know, you're. You, you know, I sit here talking uh, on behalf of the automotive sector. I mean, before this, I was building utility-sized solar power plants. We developed the third biggest solar power plant uh, in Canada. Uh, you know, some of the other work uh, that I'm involved in is is in the circular economy, resource recovery, turning what was uh, garbage into uh, f- into fuel into uh, materials that store energy, you know, um, I do know in all those enterprises, including Project Arrow, that in Canada, if you can't turn a profit on a project or on a company, you can't get a lender, you can't get a customer, you can't get an investor. And so you can't say it's, you know, that there's this false choice. It's only the economy or only the environment. You got to make it work. In China, they th- they prey on our naivete and say, "Oh, what can help you uh, achieve that objective here? Just get uh, just, just sign up from for us. our cheap products." Yeah, while our air continues to belch with the new coal fire plants you helped us set up. Flavio, thanks for the time as always. Anytime, Brian. Thanks for listening today. Full Comment is a post-media podcast. My name is Brian Lilly, your host. This episode was produced by Andre Pru. Theme music is by Bryce Hall. Kevin Libin is the executive producer. You can subscribe to Full Comment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts. Please hit that subscribe button. Listen through your Alexa-enabled devices or other devices that you've got around your home. Help us out by giving us a rating or leaving a review and... Tell your friends about us. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Brian Lilly.